we used to review personal statements all the time. We stopped doing it because it just seemed bad for our mental health to continue giving personal statement advice and then realize that no one was actually implementing our advice. Yeah. But by popular demand, we are going to review Kay's personal statement. Hello and welcome to episode 463 of the Thinking LSAT podcast. I'm Ben Olson. With me is Nathan Fox. We're the co-founders of LSATdemon.com and the LSAT Demon Daily podcast. You can be LSAT famous, share news, and ask questions on our website, thinkinglsat.com. Coming up on Saturday, July 20th uh, at 1 p.m. Eastern, we have a free class with Ala Plateau Pulverizer for Logical Reasoning and Reading Comprehension. Ala is one of our most popular teachers. I would highly encourage anyone listening to this, if you have not come to a free class before, come to this one and learn how to break through your plateau, if you even have one, in logical reasoning or reading comprehension. Uh, all you need is a Demon Free account. You can sign up for that at lsatdemon.com forward slash free. Should we talk about our uh, You Just Got More Demon? Certainly. We just... Uh, <laughs> upgraded every plan in the demon by giving everybody a little bit more of something. For the basic uh, subscribers, we gave them all the explanations for the tests in Law Hub. For the premium subscribers, we gave them all of the past recorded classes. For example, you could go back and watch dozens of Allah's Plateau pulver Pulverizer recordings if you decide you wanted to do that, you could just binge all of those old recorded classes. Those are now available to the premium subscribers. Yep. And then live subscribers got Priority Ask and a bunch of uh, new classes as well. Priority Ask just means that when we respond to Ask Button questions, which come in every day, just tons and tons of questions, we're going to give priority to the live students. Great. Well, our first email here is from Brian. The subject is stuck on review. Hi, Ben, Nathan, and or Eric. I fear that my review of the questions I miss on drilling and timed sections is not helping me learn at a rate I am satisfied with. I understand your philosophy of not moving on until you understand the question and why the right answer is right and the wrong answer is wrong. However, my problem is during review, I do this and I think I do understand the answer after listening and reading the explanations, but it's apparent that I'm not if I'm still missing questions that I shouldn't miss. My process for review is as follows. I reread the passage, try to predict an answer, eliminate wrong answers, and select the correct one. Afterward, I try to understand why the answer was correct and why I didn't pick it. The reasons are usually I misread the answer choice and eliminated it the first time, or I thought another answer was better for the question. Do you have any advice on how to proceed and do better at review best Brian. I, I want to point out something that I think is very clear to me, which is that Brian on his review is not being serious enough about why the wrong answers are wrong. Because he says, usually, you know, I missed it. Oh, because I, I just eliminated the right answer the first time. I misread it and I eliminated it. But sometimes you should be eliminating all five. And when you eliminate all five, then you're going to go back and you're going to give them a little bit more leeway and read them a little more carefully and not be quite so hasty because four answers are wrong and one of them's right. So Brian, it's never the case that you missed the question simply because you misread the correct answer you also picked a wrong answer. And that's not up for debate. The wrong answer is wrong. It doesn't answer the question correctly. You need to review both of the mistakes that you're making every time you miss a question. You might have misread the correct answer, sure. But what did you pick? Because that wrong answer is wrong. Why is it wrong? What was it that could have saved you from missing that question? What else do you think Brian might be doing suboptimally in his yeah. review. So Brian says, my process for review is as follows. I reread the passage, try to predict an answer, eliminate wrong answers, and so on, right? But mm -hmm. right there, Brian is actually, okay, you're listing out a bunch of things that you should do, 
but you're missing the ones that are the most important. You said you reread the passage. Reading is critical, but yeah. not only do you have to read it, you have to figure out, okay, is this an argument? If it is an argument, what's the conclusion? Is that conclusion proven by the evidence? In the vast majority of cases, it's not. Okay, why isn't it proven? In other words, you need to object to the passage. You need to object to the argument and then read the question and then try to predict an answer. Predicting an answer without all that work up front makes it much harder to predict a good answer. Absolutely. You are, you're skipping ahead to like the part where I want to look at the question and I want to look at the answer choices. Students mm -hmm. rush into that and instead they need to back up and start making better predictions as they're attacking the passage in the first place. So what that means is if you see a conclusion, you just immediately start objecting to that conclusion. Yep. Sometimes arguments start with their conclusion, by the way. You know, it, I, I might start an argument with like, it is clear that I should eat tacos for dinner tonight because, well, at that point, you know that I've already made a conclusion that I should eat tacos tonight. And you know that from the word because. If I say because, then that means I'm about to give you reasons for the thing that I just said. And on LSAT logical reasoning, the game can be won or lost right there. Notice that I made a conclusion and immediately start saying, dude, you don't need to have tacos tonight. Tacos are great. Don't get me wrong. Love tacos. But, you know, if I go on and say, well, I'm really hungry and, you know, uh, tacos are my favorite food. And whatever. You need to go. I, I grant you that you're really hungry. Grant you that tacos are your favorite food. But. What if you're somewhere that has shitty tacos? What if. Uh, you're having surgery tomorrow and you're supposed to be fasting. What if uh, you don't have any money in the bank account and going out to tacos would cause you to go bankrupt? And you start finding those objections before, in a lot of cases, before you've ever even finished reading the facts. You can be already thinking about those. You get them chambered and ready to go. And students sometimes think that they should read the whole thing first then start making predictions. And that's definitely not the case. You, you should be attacking as you read. Similarly, yeah. you should be looking to make connections as you read. Totally. Right. Figuring out how this, if you read two sentences that are related to each other or obviously build off of one another, figure out what must be true on the basis of those two sentences, put the pieces together. Right. So for example, if I were to say, if I start an argument with, I'm really hungry today, and when I'm really hungry, I have an insatiable desire for tacos. It's like, well, okay, you just said you're really hungry today. Then you said that whenever you're really hungry, you have an insatiable desire to eat tacos. Well, I could conclude validly from those two things that you today have an insatiable desire to eat tacos. Yep. And I know that that sounds like just the obvious, you know, it just sounds like baby step. And it is, it is, it is an obvious baby step. But you have to train yourself to take those obvious baby steps. You have to follow the breadcrumbs as you're reading. And yeah. many students don't do that. They're so focused on the lines in front of them. You know, it's almost like they just don't they're not seeing the forest because they're so focused on the individual trees. They're going from one tree to the next to the next. And they're not like realizing, OK, so there's a connection here. You're in a forest. Anything you know, more for Brian? Sounds well, like no, I'm thinking just about how we talk about this. So all of this is part of making a good prediction, mm -hmm. right? And you can, you can predict uh, where the argument's going to go as you're reading it. You haven't even finished. You've just read the first sentence and you're like, okay, I, I can see where this is likely to go. I don't know yep. that it will for sure, but you can make a prediction there. You can predict the kind of question that's going to be asked, but it's almost like we need another word for this initial process so that people recognize that it's happening then before you even read the question yeah. and then make a prediction in the traditional sense. It was like two years ago on the Thinking LSAT podcast, but we do you remember we had an episode that I think even might have been titled something about the three phases of prediction. Mm -hmm. I remember a hockey analogy that it was like, well, 
you predict as you're reading, you predict when you're done reading, and mm -hmm. then you predict again when you read the question. Yeah. And it yeah. sounds like Brian is just skipping straight ahead to phase three. Yeah. You know, of, let's, I'm going to predict an answer to this question mm -hmm. instead of predicting answers while reading the passage at the end of reading the passage and, you know, knowing what's actually there. And then after reading the question, you go, oh, okay, so you want me to help this argument or, oh, okay, you want me to hurt this argument or whatever it is. And then you revise your prediction at that point. So Brian, you need to back up. You need to slow down and just make better predictions along the way. Hopefully uh, that will help. And, and then yeah. the other thing is you, when you're reading those wrong answers, you really do. You need to come to the acceptance that it's just not a test of second best. That sure. wrong answer is not like almost as good as the right answer. It's wrong. Why yeah. is it wrong? And you have to take that on board. Last thing I'll say is add the ask button to your process. You should expect, Brian, if you're digging in deeply on your mistakes, you should expect that sometimes our written explanations and our video explanations aren't going to be completely exhaustive. Now, over the years, we are working <laughs> to make them exhaustive, but we're we're constantly revising them. We we're always looking to make those explanations better. So if something just doesn't quite click for you, if you're, if you're really, if you're sitting there thinking, um, yeah, nah, this, uh, this other answer, it, it's, it, it could have been good. It's, it's still, it's, you know, it's also right. It's just that the other one was a better fit or something like that. If the written explanation has not disabused you of that idea, then just open up an ask ticket and tell our team of tutors who are waiting to uh, respond to you within 24 hours. Faster if you're a live subscriber, but within 24 hours is our commitment to all subscribers. And Brian, you didn't mention it in your email, which makes me think that you're probably not using the ask button. Yeah, I agree with all that. I guess you talked about these three phases of prediction. I'm just yeah. worried that the word prediction is misleading because mm, my yeah. goal in the beginning is if I can predict, I will, but my real goal is one to understand yep. and two to object yep. and then finally predict. And if I can predict earlier, great, that's a win, but I have to at the very minimum do those two things. Yep. You should understand. You should connect what is there to be connected. Mm -hmm. You should object to unwarranted conclusions that are being reached. Then you should read the question. Then you should think about the, the prediction of like what the right answer might say. Yeah, totally. Thank cool. you, Brian, for writing in. Next one is from Anonymous. The subject says LSAT stress, burnout, and discouragement from tutor. Okay. I started easing into the LSAT back in January, about 30 minutes most days, just getting into the basics for the August slash September test. Now that I'm home for the summer, I ramped up to full-time study like eight hours. Yikes. Yeah, yikes. That's Initially, a lot. That is a lot. Initially, I loved it and low-key have enjoyed studying for it and learning why answers are wrong slash right, practice testing in the low to mid-170s. Which is amazing, by the way. I mean, you should be grateful. <laughs> That's so good. It, you're, all, you're already there, essentially. Low to mid-170s. I mean, yeah, I guess you'd probably like to be in the mid to high 170s, but you're always going to have a bit of a, a range and low to mid 170s is much better than like 98% of all other students ranges. So you're in a great spot. Great spot. But I've been feeling tired and decided to cut to five hours a day with Fridays off. I'm feeling guilty about this, though. OK, so. I say you should not feel guilty, Ben. No, you should actually feel maybe mildly concerned that you're doing too much and not letting yourself progress as well as you could if you did fewer hours. Friday, literally off. the opposite. Yeah. Does that mean Saturdays and Sundays also off? <laughs> yeah. <I don't> <laughs> Do two to three hours a day, six to seven days a week. Yeah. And even then, that's like at that's most. That's a lot. 
Yeah. I wrote a blog post a long time ago that I stand by, which is called One Hour LSAT. And it's how to just do one high quality hour every single day and make progress. And I think you should start with that one high quality hour. If you've got time and energy and patience to do another high quality hour, then that's great. But by the time you're on hour five and the returns have diminished, I just don't, I don't care whether you do that additional hour. In fact, I probably prefer that you don't do that additional hour. Yeah, your returns could go negative where you end up building right. bad habits for by sure. being tired and yeah. If you're feeling tired and you're feeling frustrated, and as we get into the rest of this email, we'll we'll see that, you know, emotions are running high. Yeah. Um, that means you should take some time off. You should back off of it a little bit. Yep. Also, Anonymous continues, I have been working with a tutor who normally just throws five questions on the screen removing my control to annotate slash cross out wrong answers, which stresses me out. During our last session, she focused on my weakest question type area, and I could barely answer the first five questions out of the 30 she prepared for the hour session. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, that makes me think that like, this is the first time your tutor has ever been a tutor because any LSAT tutor is going to tell you that there is no way in hell that you're going to do anything close to 30 questions in a one hour tutoring session. No, or other than sit back and watch you do questions, right? Which is not effective use of tutoring time. That's a waste of money. That's a very expensive study buddy. Yeah. (laughs) Your tutor should be, yeah. Your tutor should be, if they're picking questions for you at all, they should be picking questions that are at an appropriate challenge level for you, which means that you're going to struggle with some of them. And that means you're not going to do 30 of them in an hour. I don't think you're even going to do 20 or 15 in an hour. I think that maybe more like five to 10, maybe in an hour, 10, if you're getting them all right. And just asking like some clarifying questions. I can see why the tutor might have wanted to arrive with 10 to be ultra hyper prepared. Just (laughs) in case. 30 is like, okay, you've never done this before. Well, even if you show up with 10 and for some strange reason you get through them all and you clearly understand them, okay, we'll just randomly pick another one and do it. (laughs) I just don't see that happening. I don't see you discussing 10 questions in an hour. I don't, I I recently uh, cut my agenda for Double Black Diamond. You know, I teach Mm. a logical, expert level logical reasoning class. every other week or so. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's a one hour class and I would have eight or nine questions on the agenda and I would never finish in an hour. Well, wait a second. If I'm not capable of doing eight or nine questions in an hour, like if it was taking me 90 minutes to do nine questions, I just cut it. Explain them. Yeah. Yeah. And explain it and answer questions and stuff. But six is going to be already pushing it. That's one every 10 minutes where you're going to not only do the question, but also resolve any misunderstandings about that question. Yeah. And then also go off onto relevant tangents about, okay, well, it sounds like you don't fully understand what an intermediate (laughs) conclusion is. So let me explain that to you as opposed to, well, we don't got time for that. So we're going to just barrel forward into the next question. So, so what happened in this tutoring session was anonymous barely answered the first five out of 30 in an hour, which if you figured them out and got five questions right in an hour, that's, I don't see anything wrong with that, but you can continue. She was very disappointed saying, I need to try harder next time, but never explained how to approach assumption (laughs) questions. I left crying. (laughs) Elsa tutoring. (laughs) I'm disappointed in you. Yeah, that's, you need to try harder. Uh, that's interesting. Hmm. <laughs> okay. I left crying and felt like a failure, needing some advice on gaining confidence. Wow, your confidence should actually be pretty high given where you're practice testing. Yeah. Um, and it sounds like your tutor didn't ha- take the opportunity to also clarify the difference between a necessary assumption question and a sufficient assumption question, which are wildly different. Yeah. You know, your tutor doesn't know what they're talking about. If they try to explain assumption questions to you, 
or if mm-hmm. you're taking an LSAT class, if you read an LSAT book and it blithely mentions assumption questions, yep, that's incorrect. There are sufficient assumption questions which ask you to prove a conclusion correct. And there are necessary assumption questions which are about finding an answer that the author must agree is true. Those two things can overlap sometimes, which is why at the lower levels, you can get them right, even though you're applying the wrong methodology. Mm -hmm. But at medium and higher levels, you need to understand that when they say which one of the following would allow the conclusion to be, which, which one of the following assumptions, if true, would allow the conclusion to be properly drawn, that's a sufficient assumption question that's asking you to prove the conclusion. And the other question is, which one of the following is an assumption on which the argument relies. That's a necessary assumption question asking you which one has been proven by the facts on the page. So there couldn't be more different uh, types of questions, by the way, because one of them is like really just a must be true. Necessary assumption questions are really just must be true questions. And sufficient assumption questions are the exact diametric opposite. They are asking you to strengthen the argument to the point of proving the conclusion from the facts. And yeah, those two are totally, completely different. So if your tutor is struggling to explain assumption questions, it might be that they just don't know the difference between the two. Yeah, it can get really confusing really quick if you're applying the wrong methodology and then trying to (laughs) work your way into an answer. Yeah. Well, and also any schmo out there can just anoint themselves LSAT tutor, right? Like you can yeah. post yourself on Craigslist. You don't have to have graduated from high school and you yeah. can just put, I'm an LSAT tutor, yeah. you know? At, okay. Did you actually take the official exam? Do you have any experience teaching LSAT? Um, and yeah, l- real good test. Explain sufficient assumption questions versus necessary assumption questions yep. to me. See what they say. Yeah. It shouldn't take them long. It should be like, okay, 30 seconds. Here's the elevator pitch for each one of those question types. And if not, then they need a tutor, not should be providing tutoring. Um, (laughs) I think it's pretty clear that anonymous, like, you know, you need a path forward for gaining confidence. I'm confident that you need to fire your LSAT tutor. That's not a good LSAT tutor for you. I don't think it's a good LSAT tutor, period, but it's not a good LSAT tutor for you. So I would fire them. I don't care if you bought a package or whatever. If you complain, you'll probably get a refund or partial refund anyway. And, um, you know, if you want tutors, we have them. But I would also suggest that especially given your practice test scores. Read the explanations in the demon. Watch the videos in the demon. If you want a tutor, we've got them. But they're not going to do anything that is being discussed in this email. Yeah. Okay. And cut your time down. Shoot for one to three hours a day, six to seven days a week. Yeah. High quality prep, not just let me see how much quantity I can throw at this thing. Yep. All right. This next email from Anonymous is someone who's recently scored a 166 on their first full length practice test. Nice. They ask, I'm glad I'm improving on RC, but I notice I get the most wrong in the two author comparative reading comprehension passages. Any tips on these? Uh, It doesn't sound like you have nearly enough data to figure out that it's comparative passages that are actually giving you the problem. It's more likely you just happen to get maybe relatively harder comparative passages, which could turn out to be a different type of passage in another test. Yeah, you just scored 166 on your first full length practice test. I mean, this sounds like you probably missed three on your comparative reading passage on this particular test. And now you, you know, and maybe on one previous practice section or something like that. Yeah, and you noticed. (laughs) And if if it's more than that, I, yeah, fine. It's more than that. But it's not like you've done a hundred sections and or there there aren't a hundred sections, are there? But point is, I think your sample is probably not small enough to really justify the idea that you actually have a deficiency in uh, comparative reading comprehension. Yeah, comparative reading is just not really that big of a deal. It's instead of one longer passage, they break it up into passage A and passage B, 
they usually have some topic in common, or I guess they always have had, historically, they always have some area of overlap, but they could be from different decades, and they also could be uh, from completely different contexts. Like one could be a an instruction manual for a certain model of dishwasher, and the other one could be a historical treatise about what happened to homemakers after the advent of the dishwasher. Mm -hmm. You know, they're both about dishwashers, but one of them is for a completely different purpose, for a completely different audience. Uh, and then when you get into the questions, they tend to ask you for the similarities and differences between the two passages. I don't have much to add to that. <laughs> I don't think that there's really much to say about it. You know, yeah. you have to read. It's always just, I know that the section is labeled reading comprehension, but they're testing your reading comprehension in more ways than one. It's not just, did you understand the passages? But did you understand the question that they're asking you about the passages? So sometimes you need to read a little more carefully. They, you know, they'll ask you, okay, which one was mentioned in passage A, but not in passage B? They'll ask you which one was mentioned in both passage A and passage B. They'll ask you which one was in passage B, but not in passage A. So it's always like, okay, whose perspective are you looking for here? What exactly are you asking me? And then you have to comprehend the right answers to understand how they correctly answer the question that's being asked, you have to understand enough of the wrong answers to see how they're wrong, how that they're, that this is not answering the question, uh, correctly. But otherwise I just don't see any reason why somebody should have a deficiency in comparative reading. I, I would think that students more commonly think that comparative reading is easier, not harder. Why do you think that is? No, they're shorter. There's less to get your mind wrapped around. So you just focus in on the first passage. I will say that when I read the second passage, I am actively comparing what I'm reading to what I know to be the case in the first passage. So right. I will notice, oh, hey, you're going in a slightly different direction here. Or actually, you you seem to agree with the first passage on this point. Right. I know that they're going to differ probably in some way, shape or form. But I'm I'm noticing that in addition to just trying to understand the second passage. As, yeah, as you read passage B, you should definitely be looking for similarities and for differences. And especially when you see a difference where it's like, wait, passage A said the exact opposite of what it's saying here. Mm -hmm. That's really important. They're obviously going to ask you about that. So you need to note it. Otherwise, probably no action is required here, honestly. I It's... You know, the right answers are right because they do correctly answer the question given the record and the wrong answers are wrong because they misstate the record or, you know, they answer a different question than the question that's being asked. So that's the same as all the other reading comprehension questions. They're all just basically a bunch of must be trues. Did you understand the record? Do you understand the question we're asking you about the record? And do you understand the answer? that is correctly answering that question. All right, next one is from Alex. Um, the subject is acceptable debt. Hmm. Hello, I'm wondering what your thoughts are on my situation. I currently live in Phoenix and have about nine years left on my mortgage. I've been teaching for about 11 years at a local high school. There are only two law schools near me, ASU and the University of Arizona. My score range is a 164 to 167. My GPA is a 2.91. The scholarship estimator says there is no LSAT score that gets me a full tuition scholarship from ASU, the higher ranked school, but a 167 does. Oh, it does it for University of Arizona, but U of A is a two hour drive from me. I'm not sure if it's feasible to do law school with that kind of commute, if I moved to U of A, I would need to live there, and the cost of living would make it about the same price as ASU, $75,000. If I stay in Phoenix, I can keep a $14,000 a year music gig going and live with some family. Very little cost of living, but only half tuition. Thanks. Hmm. Um, 
have to wish in, but you got to think about how much are you going to actually pay to go there? Arizona state has a pretty big difference between resident and non-resident. Uh, it's 28,000 for resident and it's like 50,000 for non-resident. Yeah. And you know, so maybe they're not giving you as much of a scholarship, but you do qualify for in-state. So, you know, just think about how much is actually going to be coming out of your pocket. Looking at the 509 for Arizona, Arizona has, now these must be per semester, 24,500 for resident and 29,000 for non-resident. That doesn't sound right for a private school. So that must be per semester. Be my guess. Hmm. All right. Sorry for hijacking there. What's the question? I guess the question is, is it worth it <laughs> to go to a cheaper school if you're going to have additional expenses with living um, and lose this 14000 a year music gig? I do love the idea of you doing something outside of school that sounds like a something you enjoy doing, but I also am concerned you could end up in a situation where you're rushing to a gig on Thursday night and you're just thinking, ah, I don't have time to do this. I'd rather be studying. Um, people can obviously do these things and they can do law school and they can do other outside activities, but some people find it a challenge. And Alex hasn't exactly crushed it in college. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, that it's been a long time and it could have been a different Alex, but the scoreboard, you know, says Alex got a 2.91 undergrad for whatever reasons. And uh, law school is harder than undergrad, not easier. It's harder to get good grades in law school than it is in undergrad. And so, yeah, I mean, I, I'm not sure that Alex should really be planning on working during 1L. Yeah. So then you're, you might end up losing that 14K. So then how much of a difference does it start to become, right, to go to ASU versus University of Arizona? If you're willing to move to the University of Arizona, then are you willing to move elsewhere and maybe go to a school that offers you a stipend? And has a lower cost of living somewhere else. I'm, I'm kind of confused because Alex is saying if I stay in Phoenix, I can keep the music gig and live with some family. Does that mean you're going to invite the family to live with you? Or you're going to go live with your family, maybe? Or is that, I don't, I, I don't, I'm, conf I'm confused there because Alex had said I have nine years left on my mortgage. So I'm, is that you're going to move to live with your family or your family already lives? Yeah, with you? that's is that weird, you're right? You're going to sell your house, which presumably has a great interest rate right now. <laughs> <laughs> if you're going to sell your house, then you could open up to places that are outside of Arizona. Totally. Yep. Right. Which I, it, that's my biggest problem here is that Alex is limiting himself to only two schools and there's lots of schools that would with the right LSAT with 164 to 167. I mean, just put it into the scholarship estimator, lsatdemon.com forward slash scholarships, put in your 167 and your 2.91 and you will see schools lighting up in green and blue. Green is full ride and blue is full ride plus potentially stipends. And there's, you know, there's lots of other schools in the Southwest. It would, uh, it would open up all the LA schools. Um, and you might want to broaden that to a national search if money is really important to you. Why law school, by the way? That is a great question. What is it that you want to do, Alex? Do, do you want to go into big law and make a lot of money? Or do you want to work for the people do really good work and not make a lot of money. That's basically your two choices. I know that that's, you know, that is simplifying things quite a bit, but it is true that there's not a lot of people in the middle. 
We've talked mm -hmm. before about bimodal distributions for starting law school graduates uh, of salaries. And there's a small sliver of people who make close to $200,000 a year starting salary. Those are big law lawyers. And then there's everybody else, public defenders, uh, prosecutors, small firm lawyers, medium firm lawyers, solos. Um, and those people tend not to make six figures when they start. Yeah. L maybe let's jump into this article from Karen Sloan, who writes everything about the law. <laughs> Frequently seems like the only person out there who is reporting on the LSAT law school, law school admissions. Yeah. Anyway, there's an article here from Ms. Sloan about a report from Georgetown University's Center on Education and the Workforce. It's called A Law Degree is No Sure Thing. Yeah, here read some of the highlights. Yeah, let's let's read some of these. So, highlight number 1, nationwide law school graduates 4 years into their careers earn a median $72,000 after subtracting their debt payments. But that figure varies wildly depending on which law school graduates which law school graduates attended. Um, that's not surprising at all. And it's the problem with talking about medians or averages, right? Uh, you can have a wildly different outcome. If you make a lot of money, chances are you actually had lower debt from law school because you were given a scholarship or something. And yeah. if you have a low income, you're actually more likely to have a higher debt. So there's some bad... Yeah, it's just not good. But it, let's keep going. She says, graduates of seven elite law schools had median earnings of more than $200,000 after debt, probably because their debt was so low while and their income was very high, while recent alumni of 33 low-ranking law schools netted a median of $55,000 or less. Law graduates leave school with a median of $118,000 in debt. Can you imagine making $55,000 a year after your loan payments? You know, you went to law school for three years. You've incurred $119,000 in debt. And you're left with $55,000 a year. It's not what people are expecting. <laughs> yeah. Uh, by the way, that's four years into your career. Oh, that's not even starting salaries. Yikes. That's four years into your career, at which point you definitely should have gotten multiple raises. So, you know, you're you're still like taking home. What is that? Forty five hundred dollars a month. Yeah, that's your take home pay. Well, wait, is that your take home pay or is it what about after taxes? Because. Yeah, true. Actually, that's maybe not. That's netted after. So that's net from your debt, but I don't know if it's net from your taxes. Probably not. Point is, <laughs> everybody should go read this study, you know, this yeah. report from Georgetown because it's pretty damning. Um, mm -hmm. It goes on and it says, uh, or Karen Sloan's article summarizing it says, uh, quote, when it comes to law schools, the best returns are concentrated among a small number of institutions educating approximately 20 percent of law students, said lead author of the study, Jeff Stroll, who is the center's director. Columbia Law School offers the highest return on investment at the four year mark with median net earnings of two hundred fifty three thousand dollars. That's according crazy to the report. So that's after they pay their debt, which again is probably small relative to everyone else's debt. Columbia Law School clearly produces, you know, masters of the universe type lawyers. Yeah. It's, it's in Manhattan and it's a very well regarded school in Manhattan. And you're going to, uh, apparently, if you go to school there, you're going to end up making tons and tons of money. Yeah. Do you want to read that last? <laughs> Sure. Last line says, on the other end of the spectrum, 20 law schools had median net earnings of $50,000 or less after debt payments. Those schools, which include Cooley Law School, Atlanta's John Marshall Law School, and Faulkner University Thomas Good Jones School of Law, 
are clustered near the bottom of the U.S. news rankings. I know there's we've a big said bottom. this. Yeah, there's a big bottom. <laughs> there's a and huge bottom. Right? I don't there's, know. <laughs> it's a very small top. And then just, you know, there are elite schools at the top. And then there are many, many, many other regional schools. You know, this is 20 schools that have a that have median net earnings of $50,000 or less after debt. Think about how much you're making right now. Yeah. Many people, like we see people all the time who are making, oh, I've been at my job for a while. I'm making 70K. Yeah. And you're going to leave to go to law school because you think it's going to be a better life for you and your family. And these schools are like, oh, well, you know, I mean, the average law degree, the average lawyer makes $100,000 a year. <laughs> yeah, but that's because some people are making 250 and some people are making nothing. Well, or, and that 250 is even higher because they're probably making 300 or whatever and then they're paying their debt. Yeah. But- yeah. Yeah. And if these people, if these schools are at the bottom of the bottom, it goes back to what we've said before, which probably upsets some people, but these schools probably should not exist. It's hard to disagree with that. You know, let's, let's look at one of these. Okay. Falk, here's Faulkner. Yeah. Faulkner school of law. Yeah, I mean, 50th percentile LSAT at Faulkner is 150. 50th percentile GPA is 3.2. You might say, oh, but, you know, they're they're creating opportunities for people. (laughs) Yeah, but what kinds of lawyers are these people going to actually be? And how much are they going to pay in order to get this JD? I I just don't know how many of these people are going to actually be productively practicing law ever. And the tuitions are astronomical. Faulkner charges over $40,000 a year. You know, what's wild about that too. You click on the tuition. So click on Faulkner to look at the tuition roll call. No one, at least according to their 509 report from last year, pays the full tuition price, which means that is a total and utter fantasy. Number. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right. That everybody there is getting some kind of a discount. I mean, most schools do this for most students. You know, there there are you can just choose a school at random and look and see how many people are actually paying full price. Yeah. And those numbers can be very small. But when no one is paying it and they tell you that you're getting a discount off of that number. Yeah. That is it, it's total and utter fiction because. At least at some schools, maybe 10 people are paying it. Somebody's paying it. (laughs) Yeah. It's a real price for somebody. It's not a real price for anybody here. At Columbia, 38% are paying full price. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Um, But at Michigan, that's only 14%. And, um, you know, you can play around with it. (laughs) <laughs> but that's that should be a wake up call, though, because I do think that most people who start this journey think that scholarships are rarefied. No entities. They're charging everybody a different price. Yeah. 80, 90 percent of people are paying full price and some rarefied even, individuals get scholarships. No, even no. top 14 schools. Yeah. UC Berkeley, mm-hmm. by all estimations, is a well-regarded law school, 170 median LSAT. Four percent of the school is paying full price. <laughs> yeah, you know, forty-one souls. <laughs> yeah, not ninety-six percent of the class is getting somewhere between a small discount of a few thousand dollars and all the way up to full tuition, maybe even full tuition plus a stipend. Well, yeah, considering that five percent are getting a stipend, that means. Well, we don't know if five percent are getting a stipend, but five percent are getting more than full, whatever that means. So presumably more people are getting paid to go than are paying full price. Right. And this is rife within this industry. I mean, all we're doing here is reporting publicly available information on scholarships. And thank God that information exists. I'm very thankful for the American Bar Association for the Section 509 consumer protection documents that these 509 reports are. 
And uh, you dig into those 509s and you'll just realize that these schools are out there charging everybody a different price. And so you've really got to pay attention to the price you're going to pay. Um, and you have to weigh that against the return that you're going to get on your investment. Mm -hmm. So read this study from Georgetown University's Center on Education and the Workforce. You could read this Karen Sloan article for starters. That's on Reuters. Great. This next email is from Kay. The subject is my personal statement is perfect. What do I need to change? <laughs> okay. Uh, Kay's LSAT score is a 155 diagnostic with practice tests in the mid 160s, a GPA of 2.83. Mm -hmm. Kay writes, hi, LSAT demon. What I really want to know since I've heard much conflicting personal statement information is how mine comes across. I think it's great, but extra and experienced eyes might help me hone it to perfect. Okay. Since I have a low GPA, 2.83, I know I need to crush not only the LSAT, but also the softs. Thank you for any help you are willing to provide, exclamation point. Um, it's far more important that you crush the LSAT than it is you polish your softs. Uh, the you're going to need a big LSAT to get yourself into the conversation. Uh, the personal statement is, you know, the conversation that you want to have with them. It's the story that you're going to tell them about why they should pick you. Yep. Uh, but they're not going to be very interested in that personal, in that story and that conversation until you've got the right LSAT. So instead of working on your LSAT and your personal statement at the same time, I might start by just recommending that you put the personal statement aside and just crush the LSAT first. Yeah. Then start messing around with this document. All right. <laughs> we used to do this all the time on the Thinking LSAT podcast. We, we used to review personal statements all the time and we stopped doing it because it just seemed, I don't know, it was too much. It was too negative slash bad for our mental health to continue giving personal statement advice and then realize that no one was actually implementing our advice. Yeah. But by popular demand, we are going to review Kay's personal statement. We are going to try to react to it as if we are an admissions team with a big stack of these to get through. Uh, Kay has been warned that we will not sugarcoat our feedback. Mm -hmm. And Kay has assured uh, producer Eric, that they've got thick skin. So we're not going to hold back on our thoughts about Kay's personal statement. You want me to read it or sure. you want to read it? Go for it. Okay, First here we go. The most important <clears throat> heartbreak exclamation point. Okay. I will give you credit that your first sentence is short. <laughs> but I don't know what to make of it. And I'm already kind of have a skeptical eye because it's, it seems a little more playful than I want this to be. Heartbreak exclamation point. That was it. Period. I'm still lost. The feeling I couldn't quite identify when I first realized my days leading a classroom were numbered. Period. That's a fragment. Yeah, that's not a complete sentence right there. So, so far we have un... What? The feeling I couldn't quite identify when I first realized my days leading a classroom were numbered. But you just identified it as heartbreak. Why are you then telling me that you couldn't quite identify that feeling? My sense is, is that now Kay recognizes the feeling, didn't recognize it back then, but I'm Who having cares? to do a lot of work to figure out what you're trying to say. Why do I, I give want, a shit what yeah. Kay could and could not identify? I, I'm. <laughs> Who am I getting? Who is the person who's coming to me to my school? Somebody who can't identify their emotions and is a teacher. Who, but not anymore because their days the, were numbered. Their days were numbered in the classroom and they are. But I don't know why. For some yeah, unknown reason, which could be negative or positive. But they're feeling heartbreak. 
even though they couldn't quite identify it at first. Okay. It continues. The roaring fire driving the previous seven plus years now more closely resembled glowing embers. Whoa. It's way too artsy. You have a passion for teaching. Okay. The higher purpose for which I had invested my soul, my identity, my sense of self was slowly evaporating before my eyes. Wait, you had a passion for teaching, but now you're becoming cynical and less interested? That's not a good way to exit. Well, nor is it a good way to sell yourself to the next step. Yeah, I might burn out with a roaring fire after seven plus years. <laughs> my students remained my greatest love, but I could never love teaching, semicolon, and... It seemed my capacity to endure crept closer to its limits each passing day. Awful, awful, awful. All we know so far is that you picked a profession that you no longer love and you are losing the ability to push through. That's not lawyer shit. Yeah, well, the elevator pitch right here is failed teacher. That's what it is so far. We're, we're not trying to be difficult failed here. failed teacher. You know, and it's like, if, if the phone rings right now, because yep. I've got another applicant, I've got the dean of the, you know, I've got the chancellor of the school who wants to have a meeting with me. I've got 10 other applicants who want to talk to me. I've got budget meetings. I've got to go do presentations to prospective applicants. I've got all this other shit on my plate, right? If my phone rings, Yep. And I put this document aside. It's like, what was this one again? Oh, yeah. Failed teacher. Yeah. Teacher <laughs> who's losing steam. <laughs> can't can't crack it. Great. Yeah. How's that supposed to be? Put? Like, that's your pitch. Yeah. Let's Is get them here. Let's teacher? get them to this university. Yeah. It goes on. Oh, by the way, incorrect use of the semicolon there. Yep. Your semicolon privileges are revoked never use semicolons ever yep you're, you're pointing out the fact that they use a conjunction <laughs> with the semicolon anytime yep. you could correctly use a semicolon well unless it's in some kind of a list which it isn't here yep if exactly. you're using a semicolon the way k is trying to use it it means period and you could start a new sentence which means you should use a period and start a new sentence yep so it wouldn't be correct to then start with the and in this case just don't just stop. Make your sentences shorter. Stop trying to be fancy. You don't know what you're doing. Just don't do it. Uh, I will point out that this thing lights up like a Christmas tree in the Grammarly plugin. Hmm. OK, I'm looking at it in Google Docs. You said it was perfect. <laughs> Grammarly begs to differ. And it did catch that in red. It's it's the third thing that's in red. In your first four sentences? Yeah. That's not lawyer shit. I don't know what you think you're doing here, but it's not lawyer shit. There's another thing that's uh, unimportant and not technically wrong, but it just, it is strange. And that is you're still using two spaces to introduce each sentence. And that's fine. And it's good that you're being consistent. But it does feel like an old style of writing because most people these days don't do that. Yeah. Just use one sentence or one space between sentences. It looks normal now to use one space between sentences. Mm -hmm. um, oh, geez. We got an ellipse coming up. I know. Which what? OK, it goes on. I'd soon no longer be a hero, a saint, dot, dot, dot. A special education teacher. Yes, heartbreak. That is what I felt. Okay. You came back to heartbreak. It's weird, though, because there's also this sense. You kind of said that you have heartbreak, but are also like kind of eyeing the day when you'll be done because you're getting tired of doing this. Well, the students remain their greatest love. Oh, their greatest love. Yeah, But they're heartbroken about I would never, my days leading a classroom were numbered, which it's not because you're getting fired. It's because you're quitting because you don't want to do it anymore. 
Yeah. But I would cut this entire first paragraph. I don't think there's anything here that redeems it at all. Yep. That's very common, by the way. It's one of the most common things we ever say to people when we read their personal statements. That's true. <laughs> It, the it thing starts you're leading with sucks and get rid of it. <laughs> yeah. You needed to get going to, to finally kind of hit your stride. And then it's somewhere in the middle of the second or third paragraph. There's like a sentence and that's where your statement actually begins. We'll see if we can find it. As it turns out, this statement is four pages long. I mean, it's way, way, way too long. These statements should be two pages, double spaced, uh, no more than two pages. You know, something more than one, but definitely less than two. Yep. One and a quarter pages, totally fine. One and a half, great. One and three quarters, great. Two full pages, great. Not a line longer than two full pages. So this is about 100% too long. I mean, or yeah. 50% too long, whatever. How, it's yeah. like about twice as long as it should be. Yeah, yeah. Okay, second paragraph. What a juxtaposition this was to the elation which overcame me four years prior when the opportunity arose to assume the position I currently held. Okay, that's a convoluted sentence. Um, Grammarly flags it as just straight up broken. Also, just never use the word juxtaposition. You should understand what it means, but don't say it. Yeah. Yeah. By the way, I mean, we might as well go ahead and look up juxtaposition while we're here. Yeah. In my head, it means to compare. It's the, it's the, what is it? It's, is it's the comparison of two things. Yeah. It's yeah. the fact of two things being seen or placed close together with contrasting effect. So it's like you're, it's two things next to each other that are different is a juxtaposition. So yeah, I get it. You were very elated and now you're heartbroken. Yep. And that's the juxtaposition. That's fine, but you don't need to say juxtaposition to get there. Also, why? Why? Okay, you felt differently before. Which we already know. I mean, you've already (laughs) said that, that you felt that you were a hero and a saint as a special education teacher. So you're not even saying anything new, really. You're just covering ground that has already been covered. Anyway, mm-hmm. we, we went back in time. I had jumped without hesitation. As a paraprofessional, I always enjoyed days when I arrived at work to see myself assigned to C-105, the autism classroom. And now I would be leading it. And it happened on that specific October day? Question mark. What were the odds? Question mark. My 32nd birthday present was one I'll never forget. Uh, What? You want to come to my law school? Why? Why are you going to be a a great fit? It's a complete waste of time. You know, you are not making a good case for yourself here, Kay. This is a horrible foot forward. This is your introduction. You're rhapsodizing about how happy you were on your 32nd birthday, but now you're heartbroken. What are you bringing to the table? You know, there's nothing in here about what good you did. This coincidence that you happen to get the promotion on your birthday. No <laughs> one gives a shit. <laughs> it's not impressive random to anybody. Stuff it's a happens. random coincidence. <laughs> Who cares? Oh, it must mean something, Nathan. <laughs> oh, God. Let's hope it's not that. I mean, look, we understand, Kay, that it was like a big deal to you at the time. It's not a big deal to anybody else. It's a random coincidence. Who gives mm-hmm. a shit? What, what, what is it that's going to make you a good lawyer at this school? And you, having been a, a, a special ed teacher, may or may not be a some, you know, like there might be something there, but it's certainly none of this. Like the coincidence is not what's selling me. Uh, How happy you were about it is also not what's selling me because you're now leaving that field. You're not happy about it. And even if you were, then the question would become, why are you leaving? (laughs) Right. It turned out to be something that is different from what you thought it was going to be. So you talking about how happy you were when you first like when you first got it is not helping me think that you're a good candidate at all. In fact, it is making me think, why are you wasting my time with this? Mm -hmm. 
Uh, what is it? Why are, why law school? What? I'm really curious. Why law school? Yeah. None of this is telling me why law school. You're telling me there was a thing that you really liked and you think it's really super important, but now you're leaving it and you're heartbroken that you're leaving it. That's not a good case for why you're going to do law school. Yeah. And even if you try to stretch that and say, well, I no longer want to do special education. Fine. Saying that you shouldn't do X doesn't mean you should no, do Y. <laughs> of course not. I mean, and that's like everybody, we try to talk people out of going to law school all the time on the Thinking yeah. Outside podcast, right? But one of the worst cases that we hear for why people want to go to law school is like, well, I, I'm getting laid off of my job or, well, I hate my current job. Okay. Uh, great. <laughs> There's literally a, millions of other opportunities. There's anything else you could possibly do. Why law for you? Why is this the inevitable next step for you? Mm -hmm. Okay. I, I I'm losing patience. You know, it, I'm a busy person that has a thousand of these on my desk. I'm going to admit like 50% of the people that I've, you know, I've got a huge stack of applications. What do you think you do here? Um, you start scanning maybe possibly. I mean, I could read this whole thing in lightning fast, you know, just, yeah, yeah just skim it. But if not teaching, then what? I still care deeply for supporting those with disabilities and the challenges daily living presents to these unique and wonderful persons. Subject verb disagreement there. Challenges. Daily living presents. Mm. Maybe daily live. Maybe it's correct. Grammarly is not catching it. It is just awkward. It's too many words, you know, you can remove the confusion by just making your sentences shorter. <laughs> what could I do to still serve these individuals? Question mark. <laughs> okay. That's your third rhetorical question. Oh, here comes your fourth. How about what got me the job in the first place? Question mark. At the end of the first year, my vice principal had said, we really appreciate how much you advocate for your kids. I still want to do that. And that's what this career is, right? Oh my gosh. Way too many questions. A mighty gladiator wielding the sword of the English language to advocate for those who cannot represent themselves. So this person listens to the podcast, heard you say this, and now wants to become an attorney? Yeah. Who advocates for special education students. Yeah, but stop selling law school to law schools. You don't need to rhapsodize about how mighty gladiator, blah, blah, blah. Like, don't, what are you? Not good. I don't know. I, <laughs> I don't know where to go from here. Do we want to keep going? I, I, I was, I was going to say, should we? And I'm looking at the next sentence and it says, I experienced so much frustration in my career with the inadequacies of service provided my students. Okay. That doesn't sound quite right. But um, the service provided to my students, maybe. But all again, we're just coming back to problems. And now you're abstractly talking about problems in your career. I don't know. I think you need to talk about yourself doing well in special, special education or doing well in something else. Oddly, this is a case for you not to go to law school. Exactly. No, I read this and I go, you don't know what you're getting yourself into. You don't have good reasons for doing this. You don't really know what lawyers do. I mean, you're parroting what I say about the LSAT when yep. I talk about the gladiator. Lawyers are gladiators of the English language. Law schools don't need to hear that shit. They're here to learn about you, not to learn about your like thoughts about the legal profession. Well, also, you believe that you're going to get a law degree and then go end up helping people with disabilities. Um, I'm sure a few attorneys do that. but The vast, vast, vast majority never find such opportunities. Yeah, it, it looks wildly naive. I mean, it just... So many times in roundabout ways, I had advised parents on what they needed to do to obtain services I knew the institution would resist. What moved schools and other care facilities to more completely meet the needs to which these individuals are entitled? The most effective catalyst is obvious. 
threats of legal action. So Thanks. you're you're like telling law schools how important lawyers are. <laughs> but they're here to learn about you. What are you going to be bringing to the table? Teaching had been something that found me, semicolon. Something safe. Ugh. You need a dash, an end dash, M yeah, dash that's there. <laughs> another, that's your second, two for two, oh for two on your, yeah. um, <laughs> on your semicolon use. But my first dream, parentheses, apart from pitching for the New York Yankees or designing the world's most vomitous roller coaster. Okay, that's the point at which they're not reading anymore. They're done. Yep. They're done. They don't need to hear this. This, you're completely wasting their time. I, I cannot imagine reading this any further. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm noticing, do you see how many question marks are in this shit? Look how well, many and, question marks are in the next paragraph. And and fragments, just these like standalone clauses. Wow. Yeah, I see more questions. Okay. Yeah, and it just goes on and on and on. Back to the drawing board. Yep. Talk about your achievements to the extent that you're going to talk about your old job make it so that you were a success there you loved it you still love it but now you want to do more not you couldn't handle it for whatever reason and you <laughs> yeah. have, you're washed out of the <laughs> you're yeah the, the the whole heartbreak theme what what is people's obsession with semicolons like we get them all the time <laughs> they're just not useful we don't need them. And people use them incorrectly. So fine if you use it correctly. But even then it's like, well, but you didn't need it. And I see more through the rest of this statement. Very yeah. strange. Yeah. Anyways. I think we need to leave it there. Uh, that's, thank thank that's you for trying. Down. Yeah. Two pages max. Focused on the winning part. Not yeah. focused on the difficulties, challenges, heartbreak, failure, focus on here's why I'm going to be a kick-ass lawyer. Not what you didn't like, not what you failed at doing, but what you did well at. <laughs> yep. It needs to be your focus. Thanks for trying, Kay. Uh, let's move on to word of the week. This word is from me. It's deposition. Of course, we've heard this word a lot in the law. What surprised me is that I came across this word in science. You came across it in science? Yeah. So deposition is referring to the process of going from a, uh, from a gas to a solid directly without becoming liquid. Oh, interesting. So... It stuck out to me because I said, wait a sec, I know what a deposition is where you interview a party to a case before the trial to get their formal written testimony <laughs> and to use it as evidence, but I had never heard it in this scientific context. Dep deposition? Maybe Phase it's pronounced. transition. Yeah. Deposition or deposition. It's the phase transition in which gas transforms into a solid without passing through the liquid phase. So you skip liquid water. You go straight yeah. from steam to ice. Mm -hmm. That would be deposition. Oh, it's the reverse of sublimation. 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 Yep. Yeah. Sublimation and deposition. Huh. Okay. So do we think that it's related at all to a deposition well, in a legal context? I, I thought it might. I, I conjured up my own, um, you know, connections, which may be totally silly, but I was thinking in a deposition, what you're doing is you're getting someone to take their ideas and put them in a concrete hmm. form, right? That the court can then cite and use. So in a way, you're taking something that's loose and ephemeral, like gas, and putting it into a solid sworn yeah. testimony. Interesting. I... It's also an interesting little quirk of the language that sublimation, which is the reverse of deposition in terms mm. of phase transition, sublimation is like the sublime is something that's so positive. 
right? It's mm. so extremely <laughs> positive. Deposition is so negative. <laughs> Deposition is the worst day of your life. Yeah. It's just awful. Like you're just being tortured. Yeah. You went from a gas, which is free. Yeah. You were totally free. Strained and now you're to... frozen solid sitting in the chair, getting asked the same fucking question for four hours. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Thanks for that, Ben. That uh, is a very interesting word of the week. Love it. Yeah. Cool. All right. Be LSAT famous. Please ask questions or share news with us on our website, thinkinglsat.com or on our socials at LSAT Demon. If you have questions about the LSAT Demon, email help at lsatdemon.com. Check out our other podcast, LSAT Demon Daily. That was episode 463 of the Thinking LSAT podcast. Thanks all y'all for listening. Nice knowing you. Don't pay for law school. Thank you.